Hi, welcome to Dear Art Producer. I am your host, Heather Elder. Today is Thursday, October 14th, and in an effort to share some different perspectives during this unprecedented time, I have invited a photographer I represent, Jason Lindsay, to talk about how he's able to create meaningful content within the COVID restrictions. Jason was also a creative director in a previous life, and he will share with us how those skills help him navigate our new normal. Welcome, Jason. Hi, Heather. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about this. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have you as a guest. Um, I know you're a early bird in the morning, and we were just talking about how you like to wake up early and get ready to start the day. And I, too, enjoy waking up early. And I felt like when I walked down at my, got down at my desk this morning, it was so nice and quiet. And I was really looking forward to our talk today. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I enjoy the mornings. Uh, and I think it's a positive thing as a photographer to be a morning person, especially if you like working on location. But I've always liked mornings. And I grew up in a family of people that were morning people. So I think that's probably it. Yeah, well, I always joke that I'm always behind when I wake up. Like even if I were at my desk at six in the morning, I think I would be behind because, you know, I live on the West Coast and New York, you know, gets started earlier. So um, when I have a quiet morning, I really do appreciate it. So yeah. Speaking about where you grew up, I know you grew up in the Midwest and you often talk about how hard work is simply the price of entry. I've always loved that. And I've also heard you credit the people who came before you kind of instilling in you that decency and integrity are paramount and that the strength and character comes from a deeper connection to the land. And I always thought that was really special as well. And just like those people who came before you, I always think about the idea that, you know, we are now the pioneers. We're trying to navigate our way through these new times. So I'm really curious, Jason, how it felt to be shooting again and which of those values did you rely on most to kind of get you going again? Well, you know, I feel like the biggest thing, like when you talk about um, integrity and that to me was a big part of like wanting to keep everyone safe um, and th- and thinking about how we would do that and the importance of that. And it partly even also for me came back to the whole idea behind art for assistance of helping other people in our industry out, helping photo assistants out that for me, part of it was wanting to get the crews back to work. And I felt like the more safe we could be and prove it to everyone, the more people were going to get back working in our industry. And that was a a good feeling for me too. Yeah. I remember that time where there were so many people having conversations about what the new normal would look like and how were we going to do production. And there was obviously a lot of anxiety around what was going on, but there was always this sense of confidence too, that like, this is what we do. We figure it out. We always try, that's our job. And I think the industry came together in so many beautiful ways, including art for assistance and all the producers sharing information um, and photographers and directors coming together and having conversations that they wouldn't have normally had before. And I really think it propelled our industry forward in such a positive way. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like, you know, after the first few weeks of shock um, with everything, I felt like there was a lot of creative energy going around of people liking to figure out new things and liking to figure out solutions and putting their creative brains to work in some way. Um, I know other than personal projects over that time, it was exciting to be trying to figure this out, partly because it kept me really occupied and that was important for me. I do think too, the pandemic gave this odd cover, right? We couldn't do anything else, but what we were like, talking to each other and figuring things out. So, you know, normally you'd be distracted by a shoot or you'd be thinking of a personal project or you'd be redoing your website or whatever it was that you would be doing that would take 100% of your attention and didn't allow for these deeper connections and conversations to be happening in our industry. So I, I, you know, I enjoyed watching that unfold. Yeah, I agree. And I've always been a really collaborative person in the industry and in feeling like, you know, we can all raise each other up and having more of that kind of attitude. And I really saw that during this time and felt like a lot of other people um, had that same feeling. And a lot of us are just too busy sometimes to do that as much as we would like. And I saw 
pretty much everyone I interacted with seemed to have that same uh, attitude. So that was inspiring for me. Yeah, I loved that, watching that unfold from where I sit, you know, not only the photographers that I represent, but, you know, other rep friends that I have and other photographers that I know, actually reaching out, you know, beyond their own vacuum of their own business and their own world and making new friends and new connections and seeing how that collaboration, you know, unfolded, especially with art for assistance. I mean, that was pretty magical. So I'm glad it opened the door for more more photographers who wouldn't normally connect to be there for each other. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely made, you know, more deeper connections with other photographers as well. Like, I feel like I've made deeper connections with a lot of people in the industry, but many times photographers are just so busy, it's harder to <laughs> for us to connect and make those connections. And, um, yeah. you know, just as an example, Tim Tatter and I really, you know, connected and talk much more regularly than we ever did before. Um, you know, through that connection with Art for Assistance and, you know, that kind of thing has been really nice for sure. That's great. Well, I think our industry should be really proud of ourselves for, for that. So, okay. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the prep that was required to kind of get up to speed. You know, we all kind of knew in theory what had to happen, but, you know, how did you, how did you prove to yourself you can do it? And how did you educate yourself on what needed to get done? Well, I would say the first step was definitely talking with a lot of friends and others in the industry, colleagues, you uh, listening to podcasts, a lot of that kind of thing, um, social media. And then it became clear that we needed to be educating ourselves on safety first. Um, so I started, you know, finding resources online and talking to others about safety, mostly in the beginning. And then Talia, um, my studio manager and house producer and I both got certified for onset COVID safety training. And that was the beginning, I feel like, um, because it was clear safety had to be the first priority. And then figuring out how to implement those safety protocols and learning from others of, of what they were thinking and what they were doing. So that was the first step. And I feel like the second thing that happened for me is in that process, I realized that things were going to be different on set as well. And that clients and creatives and others on the crew were going to be calling in through Zoom calls um, or other kinds of, you know, Teams calls. So that technology was something that I really jumped into and figured out uh, much of that in the studio pretty quickly. But what I had not been seeing much about out there in the world related to streaming from set was doing it from locations and locations that didn't have internet access through wired connections. So I quickly jumped into learning much more about streaming and connecting through cellular connections and really dialed that in because I just wasn't seeing that. And much of my work is on location from places that don't necessarily have a wired internet connections because I knew that was going to be integral to getting clients comfortable, creatives comfortable, and then just the creative process in general. What did you learn? Because I remember having conversations with, you know, with you and other photographers about, you know, everybody thinks it's so easy to live stream. Everybody thinks it's, you know, great and no problem. That's what we'll do. But wait until you get on location. It's a whole different story. And I remember hearing that for the first time and thinking, oh yeah, what if you don't have great internet? What do you do? So what, what did you figure out? Um, well, you know, we figured out a couple of things. So one of the things we quick, we figured out on a sh our, our first big production was even if you have wired internet, it doesn't always work. Um, so, so far on our production days, three of our days that we had wired internet and we tested it beforehand, you know, our, our streaming tech came on the scout with us to make sure that everything was tested. And three days, the wired internet ended up failing out of all the days that we've been on set. So we quickly switched over to cellular uh, internet. And so that was kind of a surprise to me, I would say, that I wasn't expecting. And I've talked to other photographers and directors that have run into the same thing. I'm not sure it's, you know, crazy widespread, but I'm super glad that we had those backups with the cellular connections. I think the other thing that I, you know, learned is you have to have a lot of a lot of plan B's and a, and a lot of um, safety nets. So, you know, we have wireless hotspots, the hotspots that we have all have external antenna connections. And so we ended up getting uh, a couple MIMO antennas, which basically it's multiple antennas built into the same antenna that works with our 
hotspots, we have an AT&T and a Verizon hotspot. And then usually our techs will also have a T-Mobile hotspot as well as their own solutions. So having multiple carriers is important. We did have one day on set where we had a great, great signal from AT&T and we tested again, we tested it on our scout and about two o'clock in the afternoon, the signal went down and we found out the tower went down because everybody's phone who had AT&T went down. So we had to switch over to team. We had to switch over to T-Mobile. So, you know, everything worked out. It was a, you know, few minute delay on sex. We were, you know, kind of ready for it, but really having um, a lot of pre-planning. We look at uh, maps to see whether there's cellular, you know, connections in those areas and what kind of connections there are. Our streaming tech comes with us on the tech scouts to make sure they're able to test everything, whether it's wired or wireless to see how long of ethernet runs they might need or whether there's wireless interference. So a lot of it is prep and having a lot of plan Bs. And would you say that's your biggest advice? You know, practice it, prepare for it, have backups. Yeah, we did a lot of practicing before we ever had a shoot. We did some test calls with uh, some creative directors that I'm good friends with where we did some kind of test shoots to work out how they like to do things, how they like the Zoom uh, meeting aspect of it, whether they like breakout rooms. Um, So there's that whole side of it too, which is more about communication. And our first several tests were, you know, completely flawless, which I'm happy for because it gave me the confidence to, you know, that we were going in the right direction. But I decided to do some tests out in the field over cellular connections. And that's where I feel like the learning really kicked in and the technology side of it really kicked in and collaborating with other techs out there. And um, so. Do you find that most techs, when you reach out to them now, have kind of done the same thing and are able to offer new insights for you? Or do you feel like, you know, people are still catching up. Um, I feel like on the tech side of it, most of the techs that I talk with actually seem to have maybe one hotspot and, and most of them don't have the antennas and the um, cell boosters. You know, some of them I talk to do, but certainly I feel like we have tested and, and invested in, you know, having all of those things and, and really making sure we have the backups where I feel like most of the people I'm talking with don't have very many backups or, or advanced, uh, more advanced technology to make things work. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. And that seems like so much pre-production is so important and obviously being on set is equally as important, but if you, you know, so you can try and control everything you can, but technology is, you know, such a loose cannon. I would think, you know, your solution, what you have in place would make clients and creatives and your, your team all feel very confident. Yeah. And our, our goal is for that stuff to be in the background or if a problem comes up on set, which they just do, that's how, you know, things are and life is that we've got solutions and ideas and plans in place. And so that stuff becomes as invisible as possible so that you can focus on the creative, you know, the creativity and the, you know, fulfilling the brief and, and getting the images that we all want. And so, that's been a big part of it for us. As soon as we got through the safety and the technology side of things, we really started focusing on, okay, how do we make all this work in a way that we can achieve the same kind of creative images that we did before? Yeah. And that's so important, right? You, We started off the podcast with the intro, with me giving the intro, talking about how do you create meaningful content within these restrictions and you know, having the right internet and prepping in the right way all lead toward being able to create meaningful content because it doesn't, it all all doesn't matter if the client and the agency and the creatives and the teams are not getting what they're looking to get. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, you know, we need to be able to do our jobs and do them well. And there's a lot of different aspects that go into that in in pre-production and on set and technology, but we, we definitely have to be able to achieve those results. Yeah, no, that's for sure. I think there's no, like someone hires you and they are excited about the shoot and you do all the work. If you don't deliver, it doesn't matter if it's technology's fault or any, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, it's the pressure's on and I think the pressure's greater now for sure. Yeah. Yep. 
One thing I want to hear a little bit about is how part of your prep included updating your van, which you know I know you use to travel to and from shoots with. So tell us a little bit about your van. I also know you've had it for a while, so it's not something you created just for this, but how did that kind of become your studio and your home away from home? And what does it look like? Tell us about it. Yeah. So uh, I've got a, uh, a Volkswagen um, camper van with a pop top. And so it's pretty, you know, set up for uh, camping and stuff already. And it's a super compact uh, size. So it's nice for driving. It's fine in New York City. It's fine in Chicago. Um, so all of those things were already kind of set, but it did not have air conditioning for sleeping. It has air conditioning when you're driving down the road. So for me, I knew if it's August and I'm sleeping in it, I'm going to want that. So that was an interesting process. A good friend of mine is a sheet metal worker and we custom made some parts in order to be able to add an air conditioner. So, you know, sleeping well is important when you're on the road. Um, But it all started with being able to have a safe, safe place to stay um, and travel when I'm going to shoots because I used to fly to almost all of my shoots and now I've been driving to all of my shoots. So, you know, it has a little bathroom in it. It has a refrigerator. It has a stovetop, has a bed, it has a furnace. um, And we also customized it by adding a wireless MIMO antenna, which gives it better cell signal. We upgraded the uh, inverter so that we can power more stuff off of the battery um, I had already put solar in it, so that was helpful. Um, and then I upgraded the navigation system just so it makes it easier when I'm doing these long drives. You know, one of our drives was 16 hours from New York to home, and um, you know, all of that stuff makes it makes it function better. Um, it also happens to have a a little shower faucet in the back, so that's really nice for COVID safety for washing hands. So on many <laughs> shoots. I have not slept in another bed or used another bathroom other than my van. Some shoots, especially as we start getting into winter, you know, we'll be more likely to be staying in hotels, but yeah, it's been awesome. (laughs) That's great. Okay. So we touched on this a little bit earlier when we were talking about cellular, but pre-production, I mean, we all know it is so key to producing now and it always has been, of course, but those onset decisions or changes or evolutions of creative or something, you know, we're really trying to avoid that. We're trying to choreograph everything as best we can, you know, so that we can work out every detail before we get on set or get on location. So my question to you is after five shoots in four states over the last couple of months, what did you learn about pre-production? Are there, is there a story you can share? Is there something, you know, what can you tell the listeners about why pre-production is so important right now and how to, to really manage their time so that they can fully be present for pre-production. Well, what, what I would say is I've always been a huge believer in pre-production because things happen on set, things change, stuff comes up. And I do a lot of work on location. So we might have a snowstorm or a rainstorm or, or we might have um, access to the location be, gets cut off because a tree falls and covers the road. So whatever those things could be, the better your pre-production is and the more nailed down you have everything before you ever start, the more you're able to manage any of those unexpected things. And so that was kind of where I started from the pre-production side. And then I also realized that there's a a little difference now in that there's more pre-production from a creative standpoint, which means that when the concept comes to us, sometimes every shot in it is not achievable under COVID regulations. So we have to rethink those a little bit and figure out solutions to make them happen. So, you know, maybe they want five people all interacting in a, you know, a a room around a table. And when we figure out COVID restrictions, we figure out we can probably only have maybe three people around that table and one person we need to have just the back of their head so they can still have a mask on. And maybe we can add a fourth person if we only see an arm because they can be a little farther away, but it gives the sense that there's more people there. And so working with the creative team to, to come up with those solutions that still solve the problem and, and are getting to what the client's needs are. There's definitely more of that now than there was before. Well, the idea of feasibility, right? You know, whenever we are talking, when I'm talking to producers 
about their spec sheet and or their shot list, the first conversation is, which we weren't having before, obviously, is like, is this possible? Can we actually get these shots done? And and also sometimes resetting expectations. I'm always asking now, how many days do you think this is going to take? Because they all want us to be that well-oiled machine that we were before. We were so dialed in and we could efficiently create so much content. And now there's restrictions that are making maybe a three-day shoot maybe is going to have to be a four-day shoot or a five-day shoot. It all depends on what the shots are. So I think that's such an important thing to think about, you know, building time into the schedule for the understanding of if that shot list or what on that shot list is even feasible and what are the solutions. And, and maybe that's where your creative director background comes in. Do you find that you you relied on that a lot during this time? Um, I, I think so, because, you know, I, I started out uh, my degrees in graphic design and I started as an art director and, and then uh, creative director. And so th- going back to that, thinking the, the meetings that we're having in pre-production are often more like those meetings when I was a creative director, where it's the creative team sitting around figuring out solutions and coming up with ideas and, and planning and thinking about it. So it feels and reminds me much more of those kinds of meetings and conversations, which I've always enjoyed and, and even missed to a degree of being part of that early process of the creative. So I think that's one of the, one of the things that I would say give give people advice on, um, whether it be agencies or photographers, is that, you know, being comfortable and having those open conversations in the beginning about feasibility, but also trying to be solution oriented. So, you know, we've come up with lots of solutions. I I can't say for sure that we've solved every issue COVID related to be able to do every shot that was in a shot list, but I feel like we've certainly solved most of them and came up with other solutions that we were all happy with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about crew size. I know that um, you've had lots of different sized productions. Did any production feel more safe or less safe or different? Like, you know, having more people on set, some would argue having more people on set provides a safer environment than having less people. And I wonder what your experience was, or maybe you experienced both. I think one thing that surprised me is that having more people on set felt just as safe or in certain cases safer than having smaller crews. And the main way that I would say that is where that is true is if the concept required, you know, 30 people to pull it off before across the crew and agency and talent, it still really probably requires 30 people to pull that off. And maybe 32 or 33 if you had a COVID safety officer and a set medic and things like that. So if, if we change up the creative a bit, you know, then maybe we can start looking at adjusting crew size down to 20 or whatever it might be, or total team size, I should say, not just crew. Because when you have people there that are focusing just on safety and people are doing their jobs that they've always done, and they're not overly taxed because they're trying to do two or three people's jobs they are able to be safer, especially when you at the end of a long day or at the end of a long week when you've been on set together for five days. That's where I think a larger crew can be very safe. Smaller crews certainly can be you know, safe as well, but I don't think the magic bullet is automatically just taking a job that would have normally been 15 people and going down to five, um, yeah. unless the creative itself changes to be the kind of creative that can be pulled off with five people or two people or whatever it might be, you know? So, so far we've done, um, we had one shoot that was 35 to 40 people on set total with talent and agency and crew. Um, and we've had uh, a couple shoots that were uh, around seven people. And then we had one shoot for one day that was only two people, the two people shoot the, that was an interview and B roll. And we knew it was accomplishable because of what they were looking for. And and I think that's the important thing is you really have to have honest conversations with yourself and your team and the agency and creatives to make sure it's accomplishable on the right crew size. Well, and I think too, if we were able to create something with less crew, we would have done that already, right? Before COVID, if it was possible to create, you know, if it takes 30 people, if it was possible to create that for with fifteen people, we would have we would have done that already. So we're you know we're we are very efficient, and um, you know we, now safety is is crucial. 
Yeah, for sure. And I, I really think if you want to get the crew size down and that's an important part of it for, for you, the biggest way to do that is involve your creative team with the production team early in the process and come up with ideas and concepts or, or change them or tweak them to be able to shoot them with less people. Cause like I said, it's not, there's not a magic way to just all of a sudden go from 30 down to 15, but there are ways to do it through, you know, f- figuring out alterations and, and changes. Now talking about people on set, you know, did you talk to, and I'm sure you did and share your protocols with the crew and talent beforehand. And what kind of questions did they have for you? Did everybody seem pretty okay with everything? And it seemed you know, they, they were well-versed in what they had to do as well, or were you finding that this was new for people? Uh, our first shoot, it was definitely very new for people. Even probably our second and third shoot, I would say by the time we got to the fourth shoot and the fifth shoot, um, a lot of the crew were more used to working um, under the safety protocols. The questions were a little different in the beginning. There was a lot more questions in the beginning you know, a lot of questions about safety and how many people were going to be on set, whether it was inside or outside. And, you know, there was a lot more general questions overall. Um, One of the things I noticed that the questions or comments shifted as we went on is that people were definitely commenting very regularly, um, including a shoot that I'm working on right now in Nashville, that our protocols are safer than um, most of the protocols that they've been seeing in place on set. And that they really appreciated that and felt like, you know, not only for their safety, but a lot of people have also been commenting about how we're trying to protect our industry as well and and being able to continue shooting and that by doing it safely and providing that example, we're all more likely to keep working. Yeah, no, that is important. Yeah, by setting a good example and having people feel confident about being on set and or providing an opportunity to create content. Not everybody has to be on set to do that. I think that's a real positive. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that's what I have seen. And I have uh, another thing that I would say I've, I've noticed in general is that I do feel like we are getting more efficient with each shoot, but each shoot does present a few new challenges that we have to figure out. But um, compared to, you know, the first couple shoots, I think we are, uh, I'm seeing crews, are getting more efficient because we've got a lot of things figured out that are becoming more standard protocols across the industry. So when your clients and creatives are on set, it's obvious we have to have really clear communication channels set up. So how did, how did that go for you? Did it go smoothly? Do you have any advice? I remember popping into a shoot and the art producer really being such an amazing, I kept calling her a tour guide, Um, She just, you know, or a ringleader or something. She just, she really managed the Zoom well. And it was, you know, I realized the pressure on that person to really make sure, you know, that all went smoothly. What, What did you recognize in those situations? Yeah, certainly having someone to help navigate um, and explain to uh, clients and, and other people what's going on on set in the background while we're changing over shots um, or making adjustments or changing a wardrobe or whatever is really helpful, I think, in keeping people engaged and keeping people understanding what's going on. And then having that, I feel like having that behind the scenes camera is really nice for that perspective as well, because we tend to, we'll have one or two behind the scenes cameras and sometimes others that are more specialized cameras that are for, you know, props and wardrobe or hair and makeup or whatever. And those, those cameras really help provide a lot of information to people offset as well so that they're not just seeing the images that are shot on camera, but a few things I've definitely noticed that helped out even with hair and makeup and wardrobe, there's nothing like getting them on set with the camera, with the lighting, with the set that they're going to be in and shooting some quick images just to get people to see what they're going to look like on set. Um, So that's something that we figured out really quickly, even if we have BTS cameras rolling and showing them what the wardrobe looks like and hair and makeup looks like, there's a lot of information that gets ended up, ends up getting communicated once we shoot them on set. So we'll bring them to set quicker for that kind of thing. It's not our final shots, but it, it gives them more information than they had before. Another thing that I thought was interesting was um, we had a shoot where we had 
a creative director on set, but not a, a producer on set for them. And so the creative director was the only person from the agency actually on set and everyone else from the agency and client were on streaming. And it became clear that it was really tough for that creative to manage the call and all the information going back and forth on the call and be present and watching on set what was going on. So there were definitely delays that happened. So we would have to go back and show images. Um, we weren't able to work, you know, as quickly. So the next day, um, the, our agency partners brought someone else in to help them just manage the back and forth of the communications and the texting and the, and the messaging going on as they were watching the shoot. So that really sped things up and made things a lot smoother. So that was interesting. But, you know, as far, I would say having very open conversations about how it's going to communicate, who's going to communicate to who, you know, if the agency is going to have, who's all going to be on the call and who's going to be talking things through with the client and then communicating that back. And one of the things we found is mimicking the process as how it would work on set as much as possible is really helpful. Um, so having rooms or text conversations on the side is really helpful. I don't think we all realized how many little small conversations would happen on the side of set between this person and that person and account and client and information getting transmitted around in those little side conversations that were very helpful. So finding ways to facilitate those is really important as well. Yeah, I think that's so important to recognize that there's different means of communication, right? When you were all on set, there were people there talking and everything kind of happened together. Well, now you have some on set and some offset and some side conversations and some conversations where everyone is together. And having that kind of communication manager person doesn't mean it always might be the producer. It might be have to be another person that's helping with that, depending on how who's, who's where, right? Either online or in person. So I would, I, I would think that's something you'd have to work out too ahead of time. Yeah. And I think, you know, another thing that we have found is I'm always a big fan of pretty, you know, direct communication, not in a bad way or a mean way, but just an honest conversations. And so one of the things I've been trying to do before shoots happen is talk about, you know, what kind of relationship they have with the client. Is it a new client for them? Have they done a lot of shoots with this client before speaking of the agency? You know, is the client particularly interested in hair and makeup or wardrobe or are there areas that they, you know, don't tend to be as involved in and trying to really fine tune those kind of, let me see. So the conversations around what are going to be the most important to people and making sure we have ways to address those up front. If it's going to be a lot of wardrobe conversations that the client tends to be historically interested in, making sure we've addressed ways to facilitate that for them and head that off before it's a, a challenge on set. Yeah, that's important. That's definitely important. Yeah, because I do find, you know, just different, some clients, there's such strong relationships that they've had for a really long time and there's tons of trust built up and, you know, there's not lots of conversations. They trust the creative team to do what they do. And then there's other relationships where it's new or someone new has come on. And so there's not as long of a trust built up and then that's just different. So then there has to be more conversations around that. So what do you think agencies and clients can do now to prepare for the content that they want in the future? What should they be doing or thinking about? Well, I think, you know, use the, use. I've seen some stuff out there now that's just really amazing and so relevant to COVID. And I think that to me is one of the coolest things is try to use it as a creative inspiration as opposed to, feeling like it's restricting you. And I would also say, you know, if you have ideas that you can bring your creative production partners in on early to figure out if the idea is producible or ways to adjust the ideas slightly to make them producible under COVID, to involve the creative teams more often and try to have a really open creative relationship and conversation around how to produce things with that team. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. The more opportunity you can give to your creative partners, the, the vendors that you want to hire, the photographers, the directors, before, the better. I think that I'm seeing that unfold in lots of different ways. And 
you know, way more creative calls than just one and, you know, way more pre-production time given than just the normal amount. And it's paying off. It's definitely paying off. Yeah, for sure. So just one last question for you, Jason. You rely on empathy in your storytelling. Do you feel after all of this experience, all of these opportunities you've had, do you feel like social distancing and all these restrictions have limited you at all to tell the stories you want to tell? Um, I mean, I feel like there are limitations, but I feel like one of the things that surprised me related to that and building those relationships is in virtual casting, when people are sending in their videos from their home, the videos are so much more personal in the casting. And I feel like I actually like it better than in-person casting because people seem to have this shield up or some, you know, acting persona in front of, you know, that they're portraying. And so I feel like I can make a connection with talent faster because we have things to talk about related to their personal life and their casting that was better um, and more personal. Um, So that's been interesting. and, And so as a positive, another thing I would say is that we do, I do find that masks, it's a little more challenging to get to know new people better. So those creative calls with agencies, I feel like before the shoot, the pre-pro, having at least several of them that are on Zoom, so you're seeing each other and you're seeing your faces and you're tuning into that and you're seeing their mouths move and it just it's faster to make a connection that way so that when you get on set, you've already got that trust and relationship built up more. So, But in general, I would say I, I don't feel like my images have been different and I haven't been able to tune into that empathy. Um, If anything, I feel like we all have such a shared experience right now that requires a lot of empathy on all of us to, to get through it in a, in a positive way that in some ways it's easier because of that. It's true. It's definitely true. It's, it's such a rare thing that the entire world is experiencing the same thing right now. Um, And we can all relate. Definitely. Um, Well, this was fascinating and really helpful, and I enjoyed getting to talk to you a little bit more, Jason, even though we talk often. It was nice to have this little structured conversation on on what you've learned, and I just, I really appreciate you giving us the time today. Yeah, thanks, Heather, and um, I'm uh, I'm excited to do it and uh, certainly open to questions if anybody has any to, to reach out to me via email or social media. I'm trying to share as much as I can to Uh, help all of us stay safe and get back to work as much as possible. You've been really good about that. And your social media conversations have been extensive. So I will absolutely include that when we promote the podcast so people know how to get in touch with you. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Have a good day. You too. 